So welcome everyone to tonight's uh, constitutional conversation with the uh, Stanford Constitutional Law Center. Unlike our usual format with a single guest, we're having a panel of three uh, tonight, which means that we're going to be going for an hour and a half, but this is such a, a, a rich, difficult, multifaceted topic that we needed to bring in a, a panel to be able to tackle it. So our topic uh, tonight is regulation of the internet, self-regulation, governmental regulation, non-regulation, uh, and the effect of this on, uh, on the process of democracy, which may seem a little grandiose, but uh, over the last you know, few years, I think it's, it, it is quite evident that that is not an exaggeration of the, of the matter, that not just in the United States, but all over the world, uh, what goes up and what comes down from Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, similar platforms is uh, becoming uh, determinative or at least powerfully uh, influential in the course of democratic processes. It's, uh, you know, I, I teach as many of the Stanford people here know about, you know, the, the history of our uh, constitutional system and, and you know, Gutenberg's invention of the printing press uh, shook up the world and made Republican forms of government possible. Well, uh, social media has shook up this world just as profoundly and in ways that make who knows what possible, anarchy, democracy, participatory democracy, bringing people together. Um, but what it has really done is it magnifies the virtues and vices of human beings so that um, uh, that for good and for ill, uh, what we say is now, you know, trumpeted uh, to potentially many, many people with profound effects. And so the panel, I'm very proud to have them here tonight. Uh, and, and they are, I think, three of the most prominent commentators in this uh, area. Um, just south of us and at Santa Clara, uh, is, uh, uh, is Eric Goldman. He's professor of law, co-director of their High Tech Law Institute. Uh, and he is focuses uh, his uh, research on internet IP um, related topics and blogs. Some, some, many of you will be familiar with his blog, uh, Techn Technology and Marketing Law. Um, David Kay from uh, University of California at Irvine is probably best known for his, I think, six-year stint, was it, a special rapporteur for freedom of expression with the uh, United Nations uh, and uh, known all over the world uh, and having a, a really a towering reputation uh, in that field, especially as applied to these uh, new issues having to do with social media and internet law. And um, Evelyn Duick from, uh, from Harvard uh, uh, has uh, been a, a commentator on, among other things, the performance of the Facebook Oversight Board, uh, but uh, other matters as well, providing penetrating insights into uh, the dilemmas and solutions and uh, opposite of solutions uh, that we have uh, been seeing. And so um, I think you'll find that they represent um, on uh, not only great expertise, but also quite different perspectives. And so uh, I look forward to hearing what they have to say. They've, uh, they've divided up the universe and each of them is gonna speak for uh, 10 minutes. Um, uh, Eric is going to focus on the issue of the discretion of the various platforms uh, with respect to account termination and content removal and providing some kind of an empirical uh, grounding for when and under what circumstances these things take place and sort of <clears throat> and especially with a focus on uh, on what things would be like if American free speech law uh, applied. David is going to be giving us a more of an international uh, uh, perspective uh, about <clears throat> how these things occur uh, and are regulated and not regulated in non-US uh, legal systems and the uh, influence of international human rights law, especially Article 19's 
uh, protections for freedom of expression and how they uh, uh, fit into this uh, uh, complicated puzzle. And then uh, uh, Evelyn is going to talk about not only Ameri the differences between American and global uh, approaches, uh, but also some possible solutions, both uh, legislative solutions and self-regulatory solutions, and uh, why they're so hard and what uh, promises uh, they, they may offer. When each of them is finished speaking, we'll then um, have a group discussion back and forth about these issues. And for the last uh, almost half of the program or over half of the program, we will be opening uh, to uh, questions and comments from you, the audience. Please put these into chat and Morgan Weiland will be curating the questions and uh, putting them uh, to the panel. So uh, feel free to start offering questions uh, you know, at, at any point and I look forward almost as much to the questions as I do to the, uh, to the comments from the panelists. So uh, uh, with that, take it away, Eric. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Stanford Law School's uh, Constitutional Law Center and its organizers for putting this conversation together. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what my co-panelists have to say as well. So uh, I'm as excited to hear their remarks as I am to share mine. Um, I'm going to give you a, a sketch of a paper that's in draft. I'm hoping it'll come out in the next couple of months. Uh, it's called Online uh, Account Termination and Content Removal. It's a co-authored piece with uh, my uh, recent uh, RA, who's now a, a law school graduate, Jess Myers, who is in uh, the uh, chat here, and uh, she can virtually wave hello. Um, and the paper has two main components. The first thing we did is we tried to aggregate all of the uh, actually litigated cases over a service's account termination or content removal of a user's content and see what we could learn from what's actually taking place in the court. And then the second piece is to talk about what are the implications if we restrict the ability of those internet services uh, to make those account termination or content removal uh, decisions. And in order to understand the importance of uh, the, the battleground, oh, I'm gonna segregate um, uh, removal and termination decisions into really three categories. Category number one is illegal content or illegal activities. And I'm gonna start with the premise that the law requires the removal of those activities. We could talk about the um, uh, nuances to that statement if you want, but let's just assume that the law expects and uh, uh, encourages the removal of illegal activity. There's also a category of content and activity that everyone's okay with. What I mean by that is the law is okay with it and the internet service is okay with it. But there's a, a third category, which is uh, things that the internet service decides it doesn't want on service, though the law would permit it if it chose to do so. So it's things that it's not okay with, uh, the, house, the, the, the service is not okay with, but the law is. And those are governed usually by what I'm gonna call for these purposes, the internet services house rules. These are its editorial policies about things that it's chosen to remove or restrict um, that it's not legally required to intervene to, uh, to deal with. Um, so the reason why house rules are so important is because uh, as far as I could tell, virtually all of the lawsuits that um, uh, we've actually seen in court to date um, involve the house rules piece of it. Um, it's uh, obviously if there's no removal or termination at all because everyone's okay with it, then there's nothing to litigate over. And if it's illegal, we don't see many cases involving that. Most of them involve these house rules. So let's take a look at what's happening when an internet service applies its house rules to terminate an account or to remove content. We found uh, so far 55 cases that meet those parameters. Um, it's probably not complete. There's many reasons why we might be missing some. Um, it's not large enough to do a statistical analysis. It's got empirical credibility. So I understand that it's, it's really an ad hoc impressionistic type of thing. Um, but it might surprise you there are that many, actually, if you think about it, um, and especially when I talk about the outcomes, um, you might not have realized that so many cases have been percolating in the courts. We did our cutoff at March 15th. There's actually been some rulings even since then. So here's some of the key findings of this. The, the, the top line finding is of these 55 cases, the internet service won virtually all of them. The virtually piece is there are some cases where the internet service lost at a preliminary stage and then something else might have happened. Um, but where we've got a final judgment from a court about the decision of an internet service to effectuate 
its house rules um, uh, to remove content um, or to terminate an account, the courts have said you can do that. Um, the, the, no plaintiff has found a way around that outcome. Not only do defendants win the cases, but they win early. Almost all the cases involve a motion to dismiss um, uh, being granted for the defendant. Now, there are some exceptions with some of the content removals. Those have gotten a little more complicated. The account term terminations are almost universally motion to dismiss or something else like a uh, demur or an anti-slap motion strike or whatever. Um, the point is that not only do these cases fail, but they fail at the earliest possible stage that they could do so. These are just not getting any traction in court. Now, some of the reasons why the case is that many of the cases are being brought by pro se litigants. These are people who are not represented by attorneys. And the reality is most attorneys aren't gonna take these cases because they look like losers. There's no upside uh, uh, to them. Um, and so the, the pro se status of the litigants, I think creates some really interesting dynamics. It means in part that um, uh, if we were to change the rules, we would expect not only lots more pro se uh, litigants, we would also expect the lawyers to now potentially be interested in the cases. So the amount of activity we're seeing today, which surprised me in its volume, is a small fraction of what we might expect if the rules were different. Now, one of the key questions that I get often is, what about Section 230? Does Section 230 play a role in wiping out those cases? And it did in about half of them. But that means there's another half of cases where Section 230 didn't apply, and yet the defendant uh, still prevailed, the, the plaintiff still lost. And so uh, Section 230's role is important in this, but it's not the only reason why these cases are failing. Now, what I want to do with the remaining time that I'm allocated at the beginning is talk a little bit about why I see the, the freedom of internet services to enforce our house rules is so important. And this might sound obvious. Of course, internet services should be allowed to enforce their house rules. But in fact, this is very much in play from a policy perspective today. There are a number of efforts throughout the country and the world that are trying to take away internet services discretion to remove elite, uh, a content that's not illegal, but still violates the internet services standards. Um, and so I want to put all those efforts in play and say, here's what we're really talking about. If we were to take away that judgment uh, that internet services currently have as, in, as evidenced by all the cases that they're currently winning. Um, so the first is that that would put internet services in a, a difficult position of trying to draw a line between things that are legal and things that are not. They may be legally required to remove illegal content or, or uh, uh, squelch illegal activity, but they would be required to allow all legal activity to take place. And that suggests a border that's really nice and clean. It's clear, either it's illegal or, or, or legal. And that's not the reality at all. It's actually really hard to figure out in some cases whether something is legal or illegal. And I'll just give you an example, something like a stalking or harassment. There's a time at which it goes from being a legal set of activities to an illegal set of activities. And internet services aren't really in a great position to figure out where that line is and when it's been crossed. Um, but things like defamation or copyright infringement, these are all things that are actually fact intensive, that are uh, difficult for internet services to, to gather the facts and make an accurate determination about whether or not something's actually truly taking place or not. Um, and so the idea to say you have to get that border right, if you remove uh, any legal content, you're liable. If you miss any illegal content, you're liable. Getting that border right is actually impossible. The second point that's going to be uh, a problem act is that the reality is a lot of internet content is terrible. Now, we don't see it often because it's actually screened out by the house rules. It's legal content. It's just bad content. And we want internet services to be able to remove that kind of content. So when uh, regulators are proposing to say, we want to take away your discretion, what they're really saying is we want all that terrible content to be left intact. Don't touch it. Don't remove it. It has to stay. And that would really overwhelm the systems. We really have no perspective about how terrible people are because we actually see the breaking effect in, uh, from the current rules. Now, if that kind of content is permitted, it will overwhelm the systems. It will make internet services unsustainable. And the most obvious way to think about it is, where's the business model in offering a service that's going to be overrun by terrible content? The advertisers aren't going to accept having their ads placed next to that kind of content. They're already skittish of putting ads next to user generated content. But if there's going to be lots more terrible content, it simply doesn't work. Um, and who's going to want to pay a subscription fee to have access to a, a database that's full of terrible content? So where's the money in, in it for the internet services if you take away their ability to curate their audience um, 
uh, the content for their audience, they're simply not going to be anyone who's willing to pay them to do that kind of work. The financial system doesn't uh, uh, work. And finally, we should ignore that not only is terrible content terrible for the people affected in the particular user community that um, allows it, but it leaches over offline. It establishes a rough and tumble norm about how we expect to interact with each other in our entire lives, our entire society. So if we say anything can go online, what that really means is people are gonna interpret that as anything can go in the offline world as well. And it's gonna lower and degrade the total um, uh, uh, um, uh, so pro-social norms that we currently have will be put under pressure by the fact that we see all this behavior online. It must be legitimate if that's what the law requires, and yet it really will end up hurting us as a society. So um, the paper that uh, is going to be coming out will make the case that we really need to preserve the right of internet services to have this discretion to restrict based on their house rules and the efforts to restrict that, uh, to take away that discretion are, are, are bad policy. Great. Shall I just launch in here? Please. <laughs> okay. So um, I want to start by thanking Morgan for organizing this event and um, to thank you, Professor McConnell, um, not only for your very kind words, um, but also for the framing, um, because I think this is very much a question and a, a conversation about social media and democracy. And I think what Eric just described which to my ears was very energizing. So I really wanna thank Eric uh, for that. Um, really sets up the way I want to address some of the questions about how the rest of the world is thinking about and handling these issues. Um, and, and I like the way that he set it up around the question of platform discretion, because at the root of the global approach to the platforms is a, an effort to restrict that discretion. The problem is, and this is maybe the TLDR of, of my talk, is that as much as the, um, the, plat the, the governments around the world want to restrain the, comp the companies, particularly the largest American platforms, they are in a state of confusion, continuing confusion that they've been in for several years in terms of what they actually want to restrict. And this goes to the kind of legal but awful or awful but lawful kind of content that Eric was alluding to. So in my, I guess now maybe eight minutes, um, what I wanna do is spend the balance of the time looking mainly at the process in Europe uh, and then spend a, a couple of moments reflecting on sort of what authoritarian governments are learning from, uh, from Europe and from elsewhere and, and a moment on, on human rights. So um, thinking about Europe and thinking about trends, what I wanna focus on is sort of a, a process. So the first, the first place to start in, to my mind is to put ourselves back into 2015 and to imagine that you're a European. What's happening in 2015? In 2015, you have this massive migration of migrants and refugees who are coming from the Middle East and Africa into Europe, it's causing enormous dislocation and political upheaval across the continent. And many governments, but particularly in Germany, where Chancellor Angela Merkel had essentially announced that Germany would take in 1 million migrants. Um, there's this rise in awful content not necessarily incitement, but hate speech loosely defined against those migrants and also against, um, against the Muslim communities across, across Germany and across Europe. So this built a considerable amount of pressure on the government in Germany to do something about bad content, to use Eric's phrase, um, that was really coursing through the veins of Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, although Facebook was, was mainly the first focus. And the German government, followed by the European Commission, started not with law, but with an encouragement and a kind of voluntary approach, kind of a soft pressure to get the companies 
to agree to certain kinds of standards. And it, it resulted in, in Germany first and then in Brussels, code of conduct or codes of conduct around hate speech. Very soon after these codes of conduct developed, the, the governments, particularly in Germany, but also in France, in the UK uh, and in Brussels, really thought that the companies were behaving in bad faith, that they weren't actually dealing with the kind of content that the governments thought was problematic. Now, that's partly the government's fault because they weren't altogether clear about the kind of content that they found problematic. But in any event, Germany was the first to move away from kind of the soft edge of codes of conduct to the hard edge of government requirements of law. And they adopted um, just a few years back, uh, the Network Enforcement Act, which many people refer to by its acronym, NETSDG. And NETSDG moved from a kind of a co-regulatory or an encouragement model of restraining the discretion of the platforms to one of penalties on the platforms for a failure to deal with what they called manifestly unlawful content very quickly and other kind of unlawful content under German law uh, within a relatively short amount of time. Now, NetsDG as a model of putting pressure is fine in terms of bringing democratic governance to bear over this space that many Germans, particularly in government, had found to be alienating because you know, it was you know, basically platforms in California that were making rules about what many people in Germany thought of as the, as the public square. Um, but what ended up happening was this approach led to strengthening the power of the big companies because it was only the largest platforms that could really do this assessment of what's lawful and what's not under German law. But it also led to the problems of the platforms actually serving as implementers, adjudicators of German law in a relatively non-transparent way. So that's, that's a, a model that and a trend that we have seen adopted by other governments around the world. And I'll get to that in a moment when I talk about um, authoritarian government. Now, I'm going through this very quickly. There are many kind of side paths that we can can, could go down, but I wanna just lay some of this stuff out. In addition to the trend of restraining discretion, and that is the NetsDG model of forcing takedowns of content or encouraging takedowns of content, over the last year or two, we've seen a kind of counter trend that is actually also reflected in the Trump deplatforming case and in Republican concerns in the United States or conservative concerns about content being taken down by the platforms in a way that has been politicized. Now, putting that debate and the empirics of that to the side, we've actually seen the beginning of law in Europe that is designed to pressure the companies to keep up content. So in other words, like in Poland, as a real principal example right now, Poland has a social media legislation pending that would disallow the companies from taking down content that is lawful under Polish law. So it's a kind of flip side of the takedown effort, which is a different kind of uh, imposition of government restraint on the discretion of the companies, but it cuts the, a different way. It doesn't cut in favor of taking down content, but in favor of keeping it up. And I imagine that we're gonna see that trend continue. Another trend that we continue to see is at the level of uh, sort of across Europe at the Brussels level, we see uh, the development of new forms of legal restraint, whether it's a terrorist content regulation that was uh, recently adopted in Europe, a draft uh, digital services act that is pending in Europe right now. And what we see in these laws is, I think a couple of, or in these draft laws or laws or regulations, two different things happening. One is there's an embrace of transparency as an approach by government. In other words, government saying to the companies, we may not even have enough information to know how to regulate you. So we need more information. That is really at the heart of much of what we see in the Digital Services Act. But at the same time, 
we see a, a kind of continuing uncertainty about what is lawful, what should be taken down, and what is awful that the company should just monitor and perhaps take down, but there's not a clear mandate as to that kind of content. We certainly see that in the context of, um, of the terrorist content regulation. Um, we're, we see that in draft legislation in the UK and the United Kingdom uh, around online harms, where there's this continuing effort to say to the companies, you need to deal with the bad content, but they're not actually telling us very clearly what that bad content uh, is. So the, that's that's sort of a, a European kind of trend, which I mean, I wish I could spend more time on, but maybe we could talk about some of these trends and how they're really emerging in, in the courts and in other legal contexts across Europe. I just wanna briefly say a couple of things about authoritarian demands and human rights. So on the, on the authoritarian demand side, we do see this um, real effort in, in a few different ways to limit the discretion of, uh, of, the, um, of the companies. One is through extra legal process. And by that, I mean, we often see governments not going through their courts to order takedowns, but going directly to the companies, sometimes under their law, in order to demand takedown. This is prominent in the India context recently, where the government has made demands of India to take down uh, Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts merely really because they are uh, critical of the government, particularly critical of the COVID response in India. We've seen criminalization of account holders. We've seen data localization demands. In other words, in a place like Russia and elsewhere where the government is saying to the companies, you need to locate all of our nationals content, all of their data on our territory. And we also see uh, an employee localization trend where governments like Turkey are saying to the platforms, not only are we concerned about the content that you're, that you're taking down and, and the data of our nationals, but we want, your, uh, we want you to have a legal representative uh, in our country, which I think quite clearly leads to a kind of pressure on the, um, uh, on the companies because if they don't comply with government demands, they have this new thing to worry about, which is the safety and the legal, um, uh, the legal situation for their employees. Okay, so with all of these trends going on, where, where does human rights fit into this? I think, um, you know, it's been very interesting to see the Facebook Oversight Board draw on human rights as a framework, which I think is, is important, not only for the kind of language that Facebook itself might use in order to articulate to a global user base, right? What, what kind of standards apply, but it might also have a kind of um, realpolitik uh, uh, purpose in the sense that, and this is for the company, this isn't speaking uh, in terms of the oversight board per se, because Facebook itself actually recently adopted uh, a human rights policy, but it also gives the platform the possibility of saying to governments, look, our, you may want to limit our discretion, but we are only operating according to what we understand to be the rights that our users, who are your citizens, enjoy even under your domestic law, which is a different way of putting uh, the question, uh, if it's merely about uh, the, uh, the terms of service of the companies. Um, the UN system and many others have also been moving in the direction of increasing the normative space and the, the thickness of, um, of the norms around human rights uh, in an online context. And maybe we could talk about some of that uh, in the context of our, uh, of our discussion. But I'll simply close by saying that as much as human rights is um, clearly embraced by much of civil society and by the Facebook Oversight Board, governments themselves have not really fully embraced the model of human rights or the framework of human rights in order to, uh, uh, to determine how they want to limit uh, the discretion of the platforms. So I'll end there. Thank you very much.
Fantastic. All right. Well, I want to echo um, my thanks to Morgan for organizing this event and for, uh, to Professor McConnell for the invitation and kind introduction. Um, and to my co-panelists who, uh, you know, it's just such a privilege for me to be on a, on a panel with two such esteemed experts uh, in this area. Um, very, very exciting for me. I'm also very excited to solve this problem of social media and democracy in 10 minutes or perhaps 90 minutes. Um, it's uh, very generous uh, such a such a simple task i'll just round up what the other two have said uh and 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 we'll uh we'll sort this out i mean I, I, i'm obviously joking but i think part of the problem here is that when we talk about social media and democracy we actually don't even like agree on what the problems are or we're not really sure what we're talking about and even if we could agree on what we think the problems are we wouldn't agree on how to solve them um and i think sort of the state of the debate in the us right now is a fantastic example of how we just have different people with entirely different conceptions uh, of the problem that are basically an unbridgeable divide but if it's that hard to solve within one jurisdiction um how are we possibly supposed to solve this globally um, between jurisdictions that not only have uh, obviously different um, you know priorities and and uh, different understandings of the problems but very very different conceptions of freedom of expression um, and the the internet doesn't sort of nicely slide uh, dice up the borders and, and make that um, super super easy to reconcile obviously um, I think one of the things that happens when we talk about this often is we put positions into camps or sort of say this is the the conservative position this is the liberal position and things like that um, without appreciating how fluid these things are over time and how also many of the concerns from both sides are shared uh, by both sides and it's not just um you know it, it's not i think a, a, a good example here is um the UK online safety bill, which was just published, uh, what the, I think was last week, or in the, in the past few days, which I think really sort of encapsulates the uh, inherent conflict that sits within all of us about what we want from social media and social media companies. So they have uh, imposed this duty of care on platforms to remove harmful content. And this is not just restricted to, you know, category one that Eric laid out at the beginning of illegal content. It's harmful content more broadly defined that a, a might um, a reasonable person might cause psychological or physical harm. Um, so beyond illegal content, and there's a duty of care for platforms to to um, to combat that, but also a duty of care on them to protect uh, what they call democratically important content. Um, and you know this sort of seems to have been slid in after the Trump deplatforming, and it's like oh. Well, obviously, that's what we all want, right? Like, we just want platforms to remove harmful content and keep up the democratically important content. And if they could just do that, we'd all be dandy, right? Um, and it's like, there's this problem that if they just worked hard enough, like, why don't platforms want to solve this? If they just sort of spend a little bit more time tapping on keyboards and fixing the algorithms, we'd solve this. But it's kind of all on us uh, to more realistically say, what do we mean by harmful content? What do we mean by democratically important content uh, and 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 as David said a lot of regulations these days are outsourcing those um, those judgments to to the platforms and I guess the the reason why I bring up the UK bill in particular despite it being just like such a neat encapsulation of the problem is to say that this is not just something like when Trump was deplatformed it wasn't just the the Polands and the Hungaries of the world that expressed concerns around this uh, this was like Angela Merkel turning around and saying hey I'm not so sure about that that seems like a pretty awesome exercise of power um, and it's the UK government going mm -hmm, this is this is a kind of terrifying exercise of power and I I think um, liberals that were very quick to celebrate what platforms did in that situation might be a little bit too short-sighted if they don't also recognize uh, the the like the fundamental sort of disruption that that can cause uh, to, to to politics to have uh, private companies making those kinds of such such important decisions. Um, on a whim, you know, it could have been based on what Mark Zuckerberg had for breakfast that morning, or you know, Jack Jack Dorsey could have flipped a coin. Um, like literally, that that's how it could have gone down, and we wouldn't know any better. And so, I think it is on us um, to to think about how can we sort of 
think about constraining and legitimating platforms exercise of discretion, which will always exist and is really important to exist. So Eric laid out how the, the law in the in the US um, has uh, is sort of very clear on this, that the platforms have a lot of discretion um, and, and the benefits of that. And I don't see, um, even if, you know, even if all of that sort of law and, and case law and everything was, was wiped away tomorrow and as you know, other countries have tried to do to constrain platform discretion, it's not actually going to be possible to get rid of it. We have to become comfortable with the fact that there are going to be platforms making these decisions uh, about what people can say online forever. Um, that's partly going to be because of constitutional limitations on what governments can decide. Um, so, for example, there was a lot of talk uh, in the wake of the Trump deplatforming about how we need to democratize those kinds of decisions and we need to take that away from the platforms. Um, but it, it's a very it's a very difficult task to think about how would you write a law that sort of made that kind of decision about political speech um, in a way that wasn't inherently problematic. And I mean, we're seeing some of them, which is like you could never remove a politician uh, from, from speaking on social media, but there are obvious uh, problems with that. So, and even if you did write such a law in the heat of the moment, it's going to be platforms interpreting that law and how to enact it. And then there's just the practical problem of even if lawmakers could write a perfect code um, that's very, very detailed of like what can, people can and cannot say online and doesn't leave sort of any ambiguity. Um, the scale and pace of online speech is such that it's just never going to be the case that governments are going to be in charge of enforcing it. It's going to be platforms who are uh, interpreting those laws and applying them through algorithms and through their armies of, of content moderators. Uh, and so at some point we have to reckon with, okay, these private platforms are you know, as Kate Klonick has called them, the new governors uh, of online speech. They are in some sense, some of the most important speech regulators in the world. And what do we do about that? You know, are we happy to just leave it uh, to, to coin toss and sort of arbitrariness, or do we want to, um, to, to think about other institutional forms? And this is where it gets exciting. I think we're really only at the beginning of that process. It's really only in the last, like, I mean, people uh, like, like David and Eric have been talking about this forever and, and working really, really hard on it for, for a very long time, but it's really only in the past few years that society as a whole has sort of woken up to the magnitude of this problem and been putting so much pressure and attention um, on it. And so we're only really at the very, very beginning of working out what to do here. And, you know, constitutional systems have been working uh, working on this for, for centuries and they haven't solved it yet and so I don't think we should be way too hard on ourselves for the fact that we don't have an ultimate solution here and it's going to be sort of a period of institutional experimentation when we see different things. Um, obviously the Facebook Oversight Board is one example of that um, and I'm sure that that will come up uh, tonight and so I probably won't I won't spend too much time on it now um, except to say that I think like I like to think of it as, as Schrodinger's Oversight Board where it's like it's either dead or alive and we just don't know yet like I don't it's way too early to say whether this thing's gonna work um, it could still be a massive fail or it could be the future of like online governance who knows um, you know it, it could become the, the Supreme Council of everything that anyone can say I I, I think that's unlikely. It's probably the truth is probably somewhere in between. Um, but we just don't know. This is like such a new thing that we've never really seen anything quite like it before. Um, we're going to have to spend some time working it out. But I want to sort of spend a little bit of time on something really, really important that happened last week that no one really talks about that gets far less attention. And I personally think is like one of the most important things for the future of online speech governance. Um, and that's the Christchurch call. Um, so the Christchurch call happened, uh, it was a two year anniversary last year. Um, and for those that don't know, it was something that um, was spearheaded by Prime Minister, New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern in the wake of the Christchurch massacre um, that was horrifically live streamed and went viral um, in, in the wake of, of that. Um, and it was just a, a, like a, a tragedy that obviously nobody could ever want to happen again. Um, and well, I, you know. <laughs> most people. Um, and in the wake of that, one of the things that happened was this call, which was a group of governments and tech companies coming together to talk about how can we make sure that 
doesn't happen again. And one of the things that became central to that effort is this database, uh, this organization and database called the uh, Global Internet Forum for Countering Terrorism or the GIF-CT. And I think that that's the thing that we should be watching. The oversight board is fun um, and, and, and really important and a good model, but the GIF-CT is also something really, really important. Um, it's currently focused on countering terrorism and violent extremism, but basically there's this shared database of hashes um, that a bunch of companies, and, a, and, a, and I'm simplifying here because of time, um, but a bunch of companies share uh, to is a common resource to remove that kind of content from their platforms in the governance structure there's uh, governments um, sort of uh, contributing to how this works. Um, and it's widely seen as pretty successful. And it helps smaller platforms manage the problem of terrorist content and violent extremism on their platforms in a way that they never could, given their limited resources uh, and their, you know, the, the fact that they don't have the kind of technology that the big platforms have. Um, there's a lot of concerns about the transparency and oversight of this body. We have all of the same problems of like, how do you even define terrorism and violent extremism where, you know, one person, one country's terrorist is another country's freedom fighter and all of these sorts of problems. No one actually really knows what's in this database. Um, and it's having enormous power over sort of a, a, a wide array, a, a wide array of, of internet platforms. Um, and in some ways it augments the power of the powerful platforms because they are magnifying their choices of what goes into the database and the technology that they use over a lot of the smaller platforms as well. Why do I think it's really important? I'll close here. The reason is because at the moment it's about terrorism and violent extremism. Um, but it, once you create something like that, uh, people find it very interesting. And we've already seen a lot of governments go, hmm, that's a very interesting model. Why don't we expand that kind of thing for things like COVID misinformation or election, election disinformation or um, deep fakes? All of these categories of content that if terrorism is hard to define, these kinds of content are much, much harder to define. Um, but you can definitely see a possible future where we have like these collaborative structures where instead of what people like to talk about, which is competition, solving our content moderation problems, we actually see a greater push towards centralization and cooperation. Um, and so that's another institutional form, another form of experimentation of internet governance, um, which we don't talk about hardly, hardly anywhere near as much as the oversight board, for example, um, but it's just another thing that like is, is out there um, that we're trying for a bit um, and, and we should watch and, and, and keep in our, in our toolkit as well. So thanks to all of you. Let me uh, uh, throw a few questions out, but the purpose of this isn't to, for me to be directive, but to, just to get you all talking uh, among yourselves. And uh, uh, I have some thoughts just inspired by, by your uh, remarks. Uh, and I'll pitch it first to the person that inspired it, but to, to everyone, I'm gonna begin with the question that Evelyn was ending on uh, so she was talking about these uh, centralization um, ideas uh, like the GIFCT, uh, which causes me to wonder what about the splitting the companies up solution, which is uh, probably the most often discussed uh, in within the United States. Does that solve any problems, do you think? And I'll throw it to Evelyn first, but then uh, I hope the others will join, join in of you, all three of you unmute so that we can be more uh, casual. So I am, uh, I'm professionally agnostic and, and personally in favor of antitrust solutions. So let me sort of unpack that a little bit. Uh, I think there are really, really good reasons for potentially breaking up the platforms. I think the amount of commercial power that platforms like uh, Google and Facebook exercise um, and and uh, you know Amazon and things like that. There's there's very real uh, reasons to perhaps be concerned about those kinds of things and the bargaining power that they have with employees and other um, businesses. Um, but I'm not an antitrust expert. I don't really know anything about that. And in, when it comes to like what the things I think about, I don't think antitrust solves any of them. Uh, I do not think that uh, breaking up the platforms really solves our content moderation problems in any reasonable way. I mean, you could split. Instagram and WhatsApp off from Facebook and you're still going to have Facebook and Facebook is still huge um, and we're still going to have the problem uh, of what to do with content on, on Facebook and how Facebook should make its rules. The other example that I like to think about and talk about a lot when it comes to antitrust is Twitter. 
Twitter is like tiny um, by by m any sort of reasonable standards. Um, it's not a big business, and I don't see how you could split up Twitter. And yet, in the conversation, we spend so much time talking about Twitter and Twitter's content moderation choices and whether they did the right thing and 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 how important it is that they crack down on this or that um, and, and things like that. And so, um, I you know. There could be really, really great reasons for, for doing antitrust. And I'm not saying that just because it doesn't solve my problems, uh, we shouldn't do it. Um, but when it comes to the things I think about, I don't think it fundamentally solves that problem of like, what do we think people should say, be allowed to say online? And how do we decide who's, who gets to place those lines and how do we enforce them? I think those are really I great points. I didn't really mean to ask whether antitrust mm. Actually, it's it's Evelyn's problems that I wanted to ask about, not antitrust as a as a as a legal matter. So, you know, Dave, David, sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 it's okay. I mean, I I I, I would sort of think about this in a couple of different ways. Um, one, for me, I think, and this maybe goes to Evelyn's point about solving the problems that that we tend to be focused on. You know, the sort of the content moderation kinds of problems that will persist. In, in even in an antitrust in a post you know in a competition policy world, but I you know I think that we might want to think a little bit not only about breaking up the platforms but breaking them down. You know one of the real problems is that the platforms are very distant. At least the largest of the platforms are very distant from the communities that they are governing, that they're regulating, and they have very little insight often to the most local places where there's serious content issues. And, um, and I think we need to find ways to get the companies closer to the places where, you know, where they're, they have active markets. Now, it's complicated, right? I mean, everything is complicated, but it's complicated in the sense that, you know, one might think in the abstract, like in an ideal world, that Facebook would, you know, have a presence in Myanmar or close to Myanmar. But of course, that leads to all sorts of problems of government capture, of uh, hostage taking of employees and so forth. You know, the kinds of things that we actually see in the context of, uh, uh, of infrastructure, of telcos that are, or mobile companies that are based in authoritarian environments. But, but we do need to find ways to get them closer to those environments. And I don't think that antitrust on its own solves that problem. Although I do think that the inordinate power of some of the companies, not Twitter, as, as Evelyn points out, but certainly uh, Google, YouTube, and, um, and Facebook, um, that, that deserves pairing back. Uh, if I can add uh, to this conversation, um, I'm certainly a fan of internet services competing with each other on a lot of different fronts. That includes things like how they design their service, um, how they market their service, and what editorial practices they use. And uh, from my perspective, house rules are the way in which they express those editorial practices. So I would love to see continued competition on that front. What I fear is that actually we're going to have regulators push internet services to eliminate those points of competitive differentiation. They all must homogenize on certain standards. So for example, the proposals to turn internet services into common carriers actually is designed expressly to eliminate the ability of internet services to have competitive differentiation on their editorial practices. So I don't think we need necessarily to break up any particular service. What we need to do is recognize that editorial practices are one of the tools of competitive differentiation um, that help services custom uh, tailor uh, their offerings to their particular audience. And each service has a different audience, a different marketing pitch, and a different um, community that develops around that marketing pitch. These are all things I think are really healthy. And honestly, I fear that regulatory intervention is going to uh, uh, tamp down or wipe away the ability to have that kind of competitive differentiation. If I could just, if I could add something just from the international, because I think this is an important point that Eric is making. There's, there's real variation. I mean, it's one thing to talk about this problem as sort of a, re a US regulatory or even a European regulatory question when there's actual, 
there is uh, there is competition. There's competition between certainly for sources of information between the platforms and mass media, mass communications. But in some of the places where the platforms are active, they really are super dominant, and that that may require a different kind of approach than might be required in a European or an American context. And that that's also a complicating factor because you know that that leads to questions of extraterritoriality of of regulation, whether that's even possible. Um, and and I just think we need to be thinking about this massive variation that we have in the situation of the platforms in different markets. Several of our audience members, uh, Eric, wanted you to tell them more about what you mean by terrible content. Yeah, it's a great question. And honestly, I'm going to take a law professor answer to it. I don't have a single definition of terrible content. I don't think I need it. What I care about is that the internet services each are going to define what they consider to be unacceptable content for their community, and I want to observe their freedom to do so. But when I think about terrible content, I'm talking about content that's ultimately what I would characterize as antisocial. It 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 hurts other communities, even if it's not illegal. And so a classic example might be something like racist content. It might very well alienate and uh, um, uh, marginalize one segment of the community. Um, and therefore it's, it's creating uh, um, uh, barriers to participation and, um, uh, and uh, a formation of the community um, uh, through doing so. Um, that would be something that I would put into that terrible category, not illegal. It's, it's legal to be racist. It's just something that I think we would like to see more efforts to, to, uh, to, to tamp down. And certainly we don't want other people to be excluded from the community because of it. Um, I will point out that we did look at some of the cases that people are litigating over. So these are things that people are litigating for the right to do that the courts rejected. But so for example, there was a litigation that, um, uh, that uh, tried to create the right to misgender and dead name uh, someone who is uh, uh, transgender. Um, and so uh, uh, the idea is that this was really alienating to the transgender community. And the person who was account was terminated was suing saying, I still want the right to do that. You don't have the discretion to prevent me from engaging that content. Um, another one of the litigation was basically someone saying, I am a white heterosexual Christian male, and you are taking away my power to express all these really sexist, racist, misogynistic um, uh, attitudes um, in discrimination against me as a white heterosexual Christian male. Um, and so I, those are the kinds of things where I say, um, uh, weaponizing the legal system to preclude internet services from saying that's not okay in our community. That hurts our community. That that doesn't um, uh, that does that's antisocial in our community. That's what I'm fighting to preserve uh, the freedom for. But I'd like to hear what my co-panelists have to say about how they might de uh, define terrible content because this is actually an active area of discussion across the globe. <laughs> I can see both David and I just want to jump in and give a comprehensive and uh, irrefutable definition of terrible content that no one will able to be able to quibble with. I mean, I think that it's obviously impossible, uh, and I certainly can't do it uh, here and now. I think the point that Eric made that's really worth underlining is um, it should be context specific and, and nuanced, right? And I think one of the problems that like, again, we're at the very early stages of working this out, but I think that there is this conception that there is something that's called terrible content and that uh, every platform should have the same definition of it, but that we actually really should be much more okay and need to start thinking in much more nuanced ways about how different platforms might define that differently. So for example, um, you might have a knitting forum, for example, um, that is extremely popular that wants to ban all political speech because people just want to do their knitting. Um, and maybe that's okay. Maybe we would feel like that's a completely fine judgment for a knitting forum to make. But maybe we would feel a little bit more discomforted if Facebook said we're just going to ban all political speech. Um, I certainly would. I don't know that that's the best 
the best possible future. Um, and I, I, you know, like Facebook has announced a bunch of measures around like reducing political content in a bunch of markets and it's rolling at that out more and more and demoting it more in people's feeds and saying, hey, we'll feed you puppies and sourdough. Um, and I feel that, that that, like, I'm not sure about that. And a lot of people are kind of happy about that because a lot they have this conception that the political content on Facebook is very inflammatory and, uh, and in many cases, terrible. Um, but my feeling is like, it might solve Facebook's problem Problem. It might get it out of a bunch of controversy because it doesn't have as, as much of this content floating around, but I'm not sure it solves society's problem and I'm not sure it's the best possible thing for the world to have less political content on, on Facebook. Um, I, 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 I don't know, this isn't like a people need to eat their vegetables kind of thing, but I'm not sure that a Facebook full of puppies um, is, is a, a democratic utopia. Um, the other just like other thing that I sort of want to flag is like we might think about different rules for different affordances and one of the trends that's really cropping making this uh, come up a lot recently has been the trend towards audio uh, social audio platforms so think uh, clubhouse was the was the big one although discord was much bigger before it but people don't seem to be as interested in discord as, as clubhouse but basically every platform is rolling out a version of this right now like you've got social uh, you've got twitter's spaces facebook's uh, popping something up as well um and we might think of thinking of very different rules for ephemeral sort of live audio content than we might for um, for for posts that sit there forever or can go viral. So, for example, this Zoom call, uh, it would be kind of weird if there was the same content moderation like ability on this Zoom call as there are or as often happens when you post something on on a platform. Um, so we might want to think about how do different kinds of communication mean different things and, and how do platforms, you know, ju justify having different rules and I, I think that that's something that we're really that we haven't got to that level of nuance in the conversation yet. I think that that last point is is a really good one uh, Evelyn that you make and I think you know we already see some of that happening right I mean we see uh, legislative approaches that make a distinction between live stream um, even like in Australia for example where you, you've already seen that after uh, Christchurch so you know, some of that is happening. And I think that that actually, I mean, not that the Australian law itself is a good thing, but that distinction and that contextualization is really important. I do think that that we can, well, I think that the human rights framework goes a, a pretty good distance in helping provide companies with a framework for making some of these decisions without demanding that every company come out in the same way. So for example, there may be a difference between Twitter and Facebook when it comes to certain kind of content that might you know, uh, have an impact on the ability of others to participate on the platform, right? And that context may be very different. And you know, this is similar to the way human rights operates from country to country already. You have generalized rules that might have a different kind of imp uh, impact and implication and enforcement, depending on the context in which you're op operating. But I do think that there are tools that we can use without being too directive to the platforms about the kind of brand, about the kind of community that they're trying to build. Let me follow up on this question of international human rights law. Um, you spoke of it earlier as being more global. And you know when we have these American companies uh, like like Facebook recently uh, issuing its human rights uh, report, it it may look as though it's becoming, you know, more sort of in, broadly inclusive. But is that really true? Where does international human rights law really come from? Isn't it pretty much the product of a legally educated uh, global elite that isn't? Uh, and, and, and isn't that in, in some ways more narrow and exclusive and parochial than, than any of the real communities around the world? Well, when I'm referring to human rights law, I'm mainly referring to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and, and really the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is the central treaty in human rights law, which has been ratified by 170 or 171 governments, 170 states. So I don't think of it as a kind of elitist model. It's actually a, a model that 
you know, governments around the world have adopted as their own. Now that, that you know, creates a, a set of obligations on states, not directly on companies. And so in the translation of those rules for the companies, which I really do believe requires translation, it's not an automatic implication or an automatic enforcement of the rules that apply to states apply to companies also. But, but I think these are norms that really are drawn from not an elite process as much as a global regulatory process, the treaty making process. Um, I would also say that, you know, I, my own experience in working with civil society around the world and, and also with the companies is that the language of human rights law is the, is the one that kind of permits a shared understanding of the kind of platforms that people want and also the kind of expectations of protection that people want from their governments. So, you know, the human rights vocabulary, the human rights framework, I think in, in many respects comes from a, a kind of grassroots as opposed to a top-down uh, imposed effort. I mean, I do wanna emphasize, and, and Evelyn has written a really great paper on this, that human rights does not solve every problem. And not only that, human rights, you know, much as, you know, other general frameworks of law has a lot of gaps in it. Um, and I think that, you know, part of the effort of the oversight board, part of the effort of different oversight bodies that may be created over the coming years will, will be an effort to figure out how does human rights apply online? You know, what, what kind of rights should people enjoy in an online space? Do those differ from offline rights? But I don't think of this as an elite process as much as a process of legal development that, you know, in domestic law in our courts is also developed um, in many ways by elites uh, in our societies as well. Yeah, so can I can I jump in on that and maybe engage in a little bit of friendly fire to both David and Michael, um, because uh, on this question of using international human rights law in, in content moderation, um, as David said, I've, I've, I've written about this and I think um, I mean, it is really important and the work that like uh, David's being very modest here, but uh, the, the fact that like Facebook has released a human rights statement and that, you know, the oversight board is applying it is in no small part due to his advocacy and his work over a number of years pushing uh, platforms to do this kind of thing. Um, obviously, uh, picking up and, and elevating uh, civil society voices that had been working on that for a long time as well. So it is really important and it is progress. And I think that there are, you know, there's, uh, a lot of really uh, good uh, frameworks there and it is a kind of common framework and I think importantly it also gives us a common language and a common vocabulary to talk about the issues the problems that we have because if you accept as I think we have to that we are never going to solve content moderation we're never going to get to a point where we have like a great set of house rules or laws and we go great we are done this is it everyone just sort of go home now uh, the, what we need to do is find a way to continue arguing about this and argue about it more productively for the rest of time um and having a common language and, and framework in which to do that is a really good start and really, really helpful because then we can talk about what these terms mean. But um, I think that there are real sort of limits on what, uh, what international human rights law offers at, at the moment. Um, because we have these common principles and they do offer a bunch of, of guidance in some cases, but in the hard cases, in the ones that we spend our time arguing about most of the time, the controversial cases, um, I don't think that international human rights law, it, it, it doesn't really constrain either pla like platform discretion. I, I think of the, the company lawyer sitting in their you know, seat with pace, face with a post um, and, and thinking like, how do I apply international human rights law? And they're great norms about like legality and proportionality and, and things like that and least restrictive means, which I think sound uh, are really important principles. But when the, when the push comes to shove and you have to answer like, what do I do with this exact post? It becomes very, very hard. And you can think of uh, multiple possible ways to justify uh, any sort of action on the basis of those uh, on those norms because uh, many of them are, are very high level and that's not a criticism of international human rights law like no legal system has good answers for this yet there's no textbook where you can turn to page 67 and it can tell you what do I do with 
hashtag proud boys, right? Like that that's not um, where we are yet. Um, but in terms of whether it really constrains platform discretion, which is one of the sort of problems that we put on the table at the start of this conversation, um, I think I think that there's still a lot more work to be done. Um, and I think that's especially like for two reasons. The first is, as David mentioned, international human rights law is being developed with states in mind. Um, and how we actually apply it in, to businesses and private companies is very, very difficult. And that's in part for the reason that Eric mentioned, which is that if you required platforms to carry um, all of the speech that is legal under, and Eric was mainly talking about in the context of the First Amendment, but this is true under international human rights law too, all the speech that was is legal under either of those bodies of norms, they'd be basically unusable, right? They would all turn into like Pornhub and Nigerian princes um, offering us uh, hands in hands in marriage. Um, so we have to adjust, as, as David was saying, translate those rules to a private company uh, context. But how do we do that? And, and we still don't really have a good idea, like a, a good sort of um, concrete set of ideas or framework yet for like, when can platforms ban speech that governments couldn't? And when should they be constrained by, uh, by those norms in, in, um, in, in uh, more robustly? And then and, and one of the, the other com complexities is, you know, one of the great strengths of international human rights law has been its flexibility and adaptability to local context. And that that's why you can have different rules in it or different um, substantive outcomes in countries that are still applying the same norms. But that again, sort of, highlights the difficulty of of um of trying to decide concrete cases where that flexibility exists so it can in a sense be a, a weakness and this is where michael comes in because an example of this i think is the oversight board's decision in the trump case which did heavily draw on international human rights law and it's sort of uh, there's this uh, like one of the criticisms that i've made of that decision was that it um it didn't give facebook very much guidance on what to do uh, in making its rule about world leaders, right? It basically kicked the ball back to Facebook. Um, and I think that, I mean, we can talk about what the institutional role should be. I think the institutional role of the board should be to constrain the discretion more. And some of the, the feedback that I get on that is, but it gave them rules. It pointed to them to the Rabat plan of action, which is these six principles around what to do uh, with, with hate speech. And I think that that's a good illustration of how um, th those principles, while extremely valuable and, and, you know, have been the product of a lot of hard work, um, I think you could put down like 10 uh, speech experts and ask them to come up with a rule based on those principles and you'd come up with like 20 different rules um, because they don't necessarily really decide that that concrete um, case. So, um, yeah, so I guess that's that's probably my... A uh, little provocation on on that topic. <laughs> uh, let me bring what Evelyn just said back to what Eric's initial remarks were about, which is the the difference between the exercise of discretion of the companies versus how governments might regulate, right? And uh, there's space in there, but at least in Western democracies, United States certainly, but you know m many of the of the uh, rule of law countries around the world. I don't really mean just Western, I, I really mean uh, globally. Um, uh, governments are constrained in ways that the companies are not. And Eric was saying that that's a good thing, right? He was saying the discretion of the companies uh, is a good thing. But if we move toward a more, more of a model of democratization and thereby government regulation where the governments have more of a say in how their companies exercise that discretion, don't we eliminate that, um, that space between government and company discretion and effectively make it harder rather than easier uh, for uh, social media to deal with the terrible speech? Uh, certainly, that would be my perspective. It may not be harder, it might be impossible. Um, and it really gets down to the fact that we do put significant restraints on government's ability to censor speech, whereas we provide significant discretion to private publishers to decide what's editorially appropriate for their audience. And if we try to treat private publishers as if they must follow the government rules, then we impose all these limits on their editorial freedom, including the kinds of things that we've been discussing about, all this, these kinds of categories of content that ultimately become 
either untouchable or or can be addressed only a significant lit litigation peril from both sides. The leave up or removal decision could uh, could trigger a lawsuit in either direction. Uh, so to me, I think I think you're you're backing into the the real problem here that many of the things that we're seeing proposed from a regulatory standpoint are driving at these limits on editorial discretion of internet services, and we should be scared about that. I share that. And I, what I want to actually emphasize is from a regulatory standpoint, I, I'm, I'm also concerned about government getting involved in the actual content decisions, the editorial kinds of decisions that Eric is talking about. But there is also a significant problem around the transparency or the you know, sort of negative way of putting it, the opacity of, uh, of the companies and their decision making. And I think there is, I mean, given the impact that the platforms do have on public life and on public institutions, there's a real, I think, argument for regulation to encourage more transparency. But, but I don't think the argument should go so far as to say that government should get involved in the kinds of decisions about what's appropriate to leave up or take down with, with exceptions of some maybe very seriously illegal content, child endangerment and um, maybe terrorist content, if that can be uh, appropriately defined. I mean, the other thing that I would say is that I think there are approaches to oversight of the platforms. There's the self-regulatory model of the oversight board of Facebook that um, Professor McConnell, that, that you're involved with, but there are also other models that are multi-stakeholder. They could be cross industry. They could also provide insight and a certain kind of, uh, of, of regulation that is not government regulation uh, over the companies. And in fact, this isn't a US model, but in the, the Commonwealth model of press councils often can be very successful in providing an avenue for, for grievance, uh, an avenue for uh, transparency into how the companies uh, behave and respond to some significant public problems. So, so I, go ahead. Could I just add something? I mean, I think, so this conversation and, and those responses, I think rightly focus on the threat of government censorship. And I think that often we, you know, I, I think that that is still the greatest threat to freedom of expression and the authoritarian examples that David mentioned in his opening remarks are like are the ones that we should be thinking about. And to, and to my mind, what's going on in India right now is the most important battle for the future of freedom of expression in the world. And we should all be talking about it all the time. Um, but that said, I, I do, and, and, it, and it, so it, it may be that any regulatory model that gets the state more involved in restraining platforms discretion, the trade offs just aren't worth it and we shouldn't go there. Um, and that it, there's no way to do it. But I do think we should stop for a moment and just recognize that there are trade offs and that like I, and think about um, platforms that have complete discretion, like there was a, a comment in the in the chat about like, why not just let them restrict as much as their business interests would allow. And I just want to make us a little bit more uncomfortable with that proposition than we maybe have been on the basis of this conversation so far because of the kinds of voices that get shut up when platforms do that or the kinds of interests that determine uh, those conversations. And so we've seen uh, a very sort of big push from advertisers um, for platforms to take down a lot more hate speech or the fact that they don't want their uh, ads appearing next to controversial content. Um, but controversial content can often be very, very important speech and it can be marginalized voices trying to get their points of view out. Um, and it can be, uh, you know, things like um, things that are provocative and maybe cause people to be a little bit uncomfortable um, that, that are, are really important. And, and should be there. And things like, you know, Black Lives Matter and, and things like that, that have been really important social movements um, that, that we might want to see. The other thing is to also recognize um, that governments can get involved in <laughs> platform discretion in other ways other than prescribing regulation. And when platforms have unmitigated discretion, they're often very responsive to uh, platform needs. I think what's going on in, in Palestine right now is, is, is a situation that might make us a bit more uncomfortable with complete platform discretion where they are removing, platforms are really 
uh, removing a lot more material than in, in a lot of situations in the past. And that's like very valuable human rights evidence and things like that. Um, and, and it's not entirely clear what's driving those decisions uh, and, and how those decisions are being made and what material is being lost. So I think just the, the idea that um, they should just be able to remove anything that sort of they don't like or that other people don't like or want them to remove um maybe that's going to be the the best possible trade-off given the threat of government regulation but i think we should pause before we we come to that position so another specific policy question that comes from the audience is whether a platform should uh, prevent anonymous speech um so my my short answer is no <laughs> I mean, so to go to to essentially similar to one of the points that that Evelyn was making, you know, a, anonymous speech on the platforms can be really a, a way, particularly for individuals in uh, in difficult, maybe authoritarian environments or in especially um, repressive environments, which might be social repressive as, as opposed to politically repressive. Um, anonymity can be a real tool for people to enjoy their right to privacy, their right to learn about their heritage, uh, their right to explore their sexual identity or reproductive health. You know, all sorts of, uh, of issues around anonymity, and in, particularly in repressive environments, really argue for the affordance of of that ability on, on the platforms. Now, Facebook, as an example, has a real name policy, right? You're supposed to use your real name in the context of, uh, of your use of the platform, but they've created some exceptions around, um, for example, sexual identity uh, and gender identity and sexual orientation. So I think that, that the, the problems that arise with anonymity, for example, the problems of, of trolling, of harassment, those are very serious problems that the companies need to deal with. Um, but, but I think that undermining anonymity on its own may create more problems than, um, than actually solutions. Um, I want to echo, I agree with everything that David said. Um, I would simply point out, though, that um, I'm certainly fine when uh, internet services choose to require authentication of their users, if they think that's what's required to um, make their service succeed. Um, I think that should be their choice. Um, but to take that, uh, to make that mandatory uh, creates all the downsides that David discussed. So. Um, it really is whether it's compulsory or voluntary, and I think voluntary is fine with me if that's uh, what's, what the service needs to do. So another uh, question is, is, you know, how practicable would it be to, uh, to uh, develop algorithms that would hide dangerous or terror, they're using Eric's word, terrible uh, speech rather than removing it? Or to downplay it or you know, very, various tech, intermediate techniques. So I'm gonna take the first crack at this because I do have a paper um, called Content Moderation Remedies that talks about the space between uh, removal and leaving content up. Um, and there's actually a wide range of possibilities uh, for services to deploy. Um, and I'm really excited about the potential of internet services playing around with those different options, seeing which ones might better succeed. So things like hiding content, which I don't know what that means. If it's truly hidden from everybody, it's, it's functionally removed. Um, but hiding it from some and not others uh, is one of many of these kinds of intermediate techniques that strikes a, maybe a better balance between too much free speech, too much intervention. Um, so I think there's a lot of possibility there. I will admit that the governments aren't really interested in exploring that space. Uh, to the extent that governments um, uh, 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 specify outcomes for illegal content, they want it gone. They don't want any of this balancing. They don't want any of these kinds of nuanced solutions. They just want it gone. And so we, part of what we need to do now is fight for uh, the regulators to not dictate removal as the only option and create the possibility of these other kinds of intermediate steps. 
Um, however, in terms of allowing automation to accomplish that intermediate step, I don't, I don't think that's the right way of thinking about it. Automation is what is, is basically how do we decide if there's a rule violation and automation plays a role, but in the end, humans are almost always required um, to make judgment calls. So you can't fully automate any uh, rule violation adjudication. Um, so uh, using some intermediate gap and then saying, and we could automate it, you still have to deal with the two separate questions. Is there a rule violation and how do we decide? And then what's the best remedy for that? Is it something less than termination? So, so I, I, I just really share Eric's excitement and enthusiasm for this, this range of options outside sort of this false binary that we were caught in for a long time of take down or leave up. Like those are the only two options that platforms have. And one of the really exciting things about the platform era compared with the analog era is platforms can do way more things than a government could have, which was like the government could basically like censor you or not. Um, whereas the platforms can do a whole bunch of things, including, you know, choose what to amplify, which they already do. There is no neutral. So uh, that's a point to make in terms of the down ranking is like they're already making choices about what, what content to elevate and what content to demote. And so, you know, the question is, should they just tinker with that? It's not like they, you know, this this natural state of nature. Um, but but if they're making like an individualized choice to demote a particular piece of content, I think you know there's this. It goes back to this sort of refrain that we hear a lot now, which is you have freedom of speech but not freedom of reach. But I think we shouldn't discount the fact that um, if it's an individualized decision, there are speech interests at stake there that are still involved. Um, but I just uh, to to go back to like the the whole range of options that we have, you know, labels, fact checking, all that sort of thing. I think they do still. Um, implicate a bunch of the issues that we've talked about. But I'm also really excited by um, the ideas that platforms are starting to experiment really only in the last year around like platform design and affordances that could make healthier spaces without sort of getting content specific. And my favorite example here is maybe many, many people hate this feature and are going to sort of like get, get angry at this suggestion, but I, I love it. Um, it's Twitter's little pop up that says if you try and retweet an article that you haven't read, it's like, hey, do you want to read this before retweeting this? It's like the most gentle possible nudge. And you can be like, no, retweet. Like, who are you to tell me what to do? Um, but just that one extra screen of saying, hey, do you want to be a little bit thoughtful about what you're spreading? 40% more people clicked through and read the article. 40%. That's insane. We are such silly creatures. Um, but if you could think of like the, the the impact of some like tiny modification like that and where we might introduce a little bit more friction and a little bit more sort of prompts to be thoughtful about what we're doing online that are content neutral and, and don't require judgments, that stuff is what gets me really excited. Um, I just want to end on one quick thing, which is that, but we need to know that it works. Like that's a good piece of data. Twitter, you know, just sort of bestowed it on high and we don't know if it's real. Uh, things like like Labels, it makes us feel better if they're there, but do they actually work? Do they actually convince any, anyone? And so this goes back to sort of the comment that I opened with, which was we don't really even know what the problems are. And so we need much more access to data uh, of what's going on within these platforms and independent researchers to sort of get verification of like what's working and what's not working. To go, to go back to the penultimate point that, that Evelyn made, I think you know, one of the interesting things about that friction is that it's content neutral. Right, it, it's it's a friction that applies to whatever the content is, whatever the article is. It's not related to what the nature of that content is, or or the or or the political position, or or anything else about it. And that I think helps in in thinking about the kinds of steps that the companies can take. So one of the questions around anonymity, which I saw uh, in the chat was around, you know, how do you deal with bots and fake accounts and, and so forth? Well, there are tools that the platforms have that are, you know, not identical to, but not, but they're in the same category of dealing with problems like spam. And the companies can deal with those kinds of problems without making, this isn't true across the board, but they can do some of that without dealing with, you know, the question of what content is good and what content is bad. And I think some of that can, can happen in a way that's, that's actually, you know, similar to our kind of time, place, and manner sorts of restrictions, right? They're not, they're not content discriminatory, but they still do have an impact on uh, on speech. Are there other non-content discriminatory approaches that you wish people were talking about? 
I would love to hear what Eric says about that in part because, because of his work uh, on remedies. Uh, you kind of caught me a little flat footed. I haven't really thought about the question that way. I think that David's uh, discussion about transparency might fit that category. I think that uh, I think that's supposed to get squarely at the issue. Um, in terms of uh, the uh, the various remedies I discuss, um, uh, I think that most of them were designed to be specific to a particular violation. So I think all of those start with the premise that they are content based. I just say that the realm of options here is probably more limited by our imagination than any technological fact, right? Like I think we uh, we think of these platforms as like something sort of fixed and but nothing about them is inevitable and we could like throw it all, like nothing about them is natural and we could throw out a bunch of different things and think of a bunch of different options. So you could, for example, uh, it won't happen, but it could happen. like. Think of a Facebook without a share button or a Twitter without a retweet button or without a like button or like maybe a like button doesn't like, you know, Instagram's experimenting with turning off metrics and, and likes so that you can't see um, how much people are liking things. So you don't have th those kinds of social signals. Or you can think about like a, another thing that uh, is increasingly being popular across a bunch of platforms is if you post some, if you'd go to reply or post something that has certain words in it that the that the algorithm like will identify as potentially offensive rather than saying you can't post that a little pop-up will come up and say Do you want to just check that you're not being super offensive in what you say here and again it was some surprising percentage in the 30 percent range of people who were like oh you know what yeah this actually is a bit rude i'm just going to rephrase this and post something else things like that where you're just encouraging people to be a little bit more thoughtful online um i think are really promising of course, the, the thoughtful part is great, but the dealing with the, the emotional content, the likes, the upvoting, all of that is really central to the platform's business models. And so sort of disentangling that from sort of the, the content issues is going to be extremely difficult. But, but I do think that, you know, one example that, I, that Facebook has pioneered in terms of not focused so much on the content, but on the behavior is their approach to coordinated inauthentic behavior. And, and that you know, has been, you know, in some ways, an evolving approach by, by Facebook to deal with assaults on the platform, uh, with all sorts of activity that might be problematic for either what it considers its community or for the public. But that's an approach that isn't focused specifically on the content itself, but on the the signals that the company gets and other companies do this as well you know from the interactions of accounts so how good are they at detecting that are there false positives i think quite quite a bit um but you know facebook has a pretty rigorous social science team that is aiming to get better and better at that um i mean most and one of the positive elements here is that the company, and I should say the companies, because others, Facebook isn't alone in doing this, they are um, they're reporting about coordinated inauthentic behavior, trying to provide more information. It's not enough. Evelyn is absolutely right. There is very limited information. There's very limited access for researchers to get under the hood and see, for example, the, the false positive rate. Um, but hopefully we're, we're moving in that direction. So I, I just, just about the question about false positives. Um, you also have to ask the false negative rate. You can dial up or down the sensitivity of any filter. And so you, you just have to pick which, which side you're gonna optimize because you're gonna have it on both sides. <laughs> Yeah, fundamentally agree with that point about trade-offs. We need to talk about that a lot more. We're never going to have perfect enforcement, so we need to choose what kind of errors we want. But just to really quickly, because I know we're at time, on the coordinated and authentic behavior, I have one, one and a half papers already and another paper coming out shortly on this. Um, it, the way Facebook, like first, the, the, the term was invented by Facebook. Um, it came out of the 2016 election and it's actually a very like narrowly defined category of behavior that involves fake accounts. And it's kind of like this mimetic proliferation of the, the words across a bunch of platforms and things to describe a, a pretty amorphous set of activities. And we don't have a good societal definition of like what is problematic 
coordination online and what is just like grassroots activism and a bunch of people coming together and saying let's post the same thing at the same time to get our message out um, and that's something that we as a society again need to have a much broader conversation about um, because I don't think there is uh, very much awareness of how like non-objective um, though those terms are and the judgments that platforms are making when it comes to using the behavioral signals but they're expanding those that tool set rapidly like they're using behavioral signals to take down more and more kinds of content um, and I think that's something we need to have a, a much bigger conversation about as well. Well there are many other wonderful questions in the that the audience has put forward but uh, there are not many wonderful more minutes in our uh, uh, in our program so uh, with that let me just thank you uh, very much for for being with us uh, and uh, I, I like to you know invite the audience to uh, uh, join me and applause. You can't applaud for yourself, Eric. Applaud for Eric and uh, and David and Evelyn uh, for an extremely interesting and 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 uh, uh, illuminating uh, conversation on on this you know so so difficult topic. Um, and so this brings us to the end of our series of constitutional conversations for the uh, academic year. Uh, you know, uh, hopefully next year or in the fall, we're going to begin having these in person uh, again, but, uh, but it's been good to have Zoom audiences uh, uh, in far-flung uh, places. Uh, you know, we, we have uh, audience participation even as, as far down as Santa Clara, uh, uh, Eric. So uh, uh, we'll be working on exactly what the model will be when the world opens up again. So uh, 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 stay tuned for uh, other uh, topics and other speakers. So again, thank you three. Uh Thanks.